Kelly here to talk with us about her latest book that's coming out this Tuesday called How to Think Like a Lawyer and Why. She's former U.S. assistant attorney. She's a professor over at the Baltimore School of Law. She's an accomplished author, obviously, of several books. Uh, she's one of our favorites, and you can catch her across the television dial. And that is Kim Whaley. Kim, Mike, and Nick, thank you so much for hopping back on with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to chat again. It was fun yeah. last time. It was fun last time. Nick uh, Nick loves to reference everything you said there because of the doom and gloom. We're going to get into some of that in, in a bit. Um, it's worse now. Sorry to tell you. <laughs> oh, we're going to get into it. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, we're going to get into it. Wait, let's, let's go through the questions first on the book. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Kim, talk to us about the book. It comes out this Tuesday. What made you want to write it? Uh, interest of full disclosure. Uh, I got into a contest with my uh, old girlfriend who ended up going to law school and trying to take the LSATs just to show her that I could be a lawyer one day. You brought so, an X into this? Yeah. So this book Damn. is made for me about thinking like a lawyer. I always feel like I'm up to date on the legalities of certain things in certain states. But what made you want to write this book? Well, you know what? It was it was uh, an unexpected third book that followed from the first two. And let me explain why. The first one was on the Constitution, and the goal was to bring constitutional literacy to regular people in a way that wasn't just describing things, right? To relating it to your regular everyday life. And once I finished that book, I realized after, you know, a decade and a half of teaching law that everything comes down to the ballot box. That's how that's how we hold people accountable. That's that is that's the ticket for speeding. That's the um, the boss firing you because you showed up late too many times and and so I wrote that one as kind of a step two. And then and then we got to, um, you know, the, the later part of the Trump years with two impeachments. And of course, since then, it's been the big lie. It's the January insurrection. And I realized that what I've been doing all these years teaching law students is is encouraging them to look for questions, not answers. Um, and we're in so polarized in terms of how we approach the world. It's this is my team. This is the answer. This is my position. I'm going to dig in and and I don't care what the facts are. I don't care what the sort of ethics of it are. This is my team and that's how I I have my identity and that's how I find my strength and looked around. I mean, there there really is not any commercial book for the very unique skill, frankly, of, of thinking like a lawyer. So here it was, you know, it's expensive to hire lawyers. It's scary to hire lawyers. So this is, I, I outline a five-step way of approaching problems that I've honed for myself over the years. I have a unique way of teaching that people can just bring to their everyday lives, walk through all the five steps. And even without a law degree, you will have done the kind of thorough, careful, comprehensive analysis that people pay lawyers for. Now, you know, it doesn't talk about the law. There is actually, I should say, they talk about, it talks about cases to introduce my five-part method. But, but law school is more about teaching people, again, how to think differently in a way you're, you're probing the questions, you're looking for the gray areas, you're, you're trying to find the counter arguments, because if you don't, you're going to lose your case. And it's a very, very different way of approaching big issues then I think we are in, in both in our private lives oftentimes and in the broader community, in the broader public nationally. And also, I you know, it, big problems are overwhelming for people. So, um, I mean, I, I just even as a lawyer, I get flooded sometimes, it's overwhelming. So this is a way in people's personal lives to to bring some order to that chaos and and get back to our common sense and our humanity as a community is my is my goal. Kim, when you think about you know developing that legal mind, and you know, and one of the things that your book talks about is how does that how does that work for you in so many different spaces, you know, beyond the courtroom? Can you think of just a time recently, just personally or professionally, where without that sort of legal training, like your approach to something would have been vastly different? Like the prism with which you look at a particular issue looks very different had you not pers pursued a career in law. Yeah, I mean, great example comes to mind, which is a took my kids to Disney World a few months ago. And uh, I, you know, full disclosure, I, I'm not an adherent to the myth or the lie that 
um, that President Biden is improperly in office and all that fraud. And because I, mean, I am a lawyer, 60 plus cases were thrown out because there's no evidence of that. So I just want to establish that. Um, but I got into an Uber with my kids on the way to the airport. It's probably a 45 minute drive. And the Uber driver uh, had a very different point of view and was on a rant the second we got in the car. And, um, and we had a long drive ahead of us. <laughs> and I should, and by the end of the, by the end of the ride, he was inviting me down for scuba diving lessons and, you know, wanted me to make sure that, he, that I touched base, that I was safely back in my, at home, et cetera. Meaning he felt very connected. And my kids said, how did you do that, mom? And I'll tell you, at one point he even said, gosh, I, when I realized where you probably are politically, I almost pulled over and, and let you out of the car. I mean, it was, it was one of those situations. So how did I do it? Um, you know, uh, you, you find common ground, ask questions, started the conversation around shared values in your regular life. So this isn't something we do as lawyers, but, but you do have to think from every angle. You have, to, you have to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And one thing that we established was that, you know, politicians have their own motivations and they're not the same as they have for you and your family. Once we had gotten that established, that we have, we see something, we have a common ground, then we were able I was able to sort of talk about some of these other issues in a way that he felt less threatened and I could try on parts of what he said that I felt comfortable with, that I was okay with. I mean, that's, that's not exactly the five part framework that I put in the, in the book where you, you have a problem that you need to solve, but it is, it is relevant in terms of, um, again, looking for questions, not answers, not getting dug into a particular point of view because you believe it's right. And my own children said, wow, mom, that was kind of uncomfortable in the beginning. That, how did you do that? So, th so that, that I don't think for sure I could do without a law degree um, and without having to teach, frankly, uh, in an era where the constitution itself has become political. So, I mean, I, was, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, went to an all girls school uh, early on in the Trump era again, because you know, that's just where things really went off the deep end with the constitution. I was invited to do the commencement speech. I was disinvited because parents complained and we're gonna boycott the, the graduation because they said the, that my book on the constitution was too political. So, so, you know, that's where we are. So, oh. so how do you get around that? You can be outraged, you can, you know, get reactive. We all have that or you can take a deep breath and start laying out foundational concepts, bite-sized pieces that people can deal with. That's what lawyers do. And that's the first step of the, of the five-step process I put in the book, break stuff down, break stuff down into smaller issues, and then go back to the big one. Kim, I appreciate you sharing that because I don't find you controversial at all. I don't know where they came up with that. Um, I do. I will say that um, when sharing the podcast with a family friend, the episode that you appeared on, um, the father, now, interest of full disclosure, he watches Newsmax, and I've told him to stop doing that. I'm a former Fox producer. I know what far right looks like. Um, and he was very, um, oh, I know Kim Whaley. No, she's too XYZ for me. And so he's like, I'm not going to listen to that. And I was like, what? Kim, is this the same Kim Whaley I'm talking about? But, but I want to get into, and I appreciate you sharing that, but I want, I want to get into, uh, I've, I've asked this of other authors that have been on here, Ellie, when his book came out about Bill Barr. And, you know, the bookstore right now is someplace, I have an Amazon, I mean, uh, Barnes and Nobles near me. And I take my young daughter there all the time. And I see these political aisles now where the books are, you know, kind of here are the conservative books and here are the liberal leaning books. Somebody walks into the Barnes and Noble and sees Kim Whaley's book. What is it that you want them to think about as to why they should purchase this book without even opening it up? I think it, it's a way to make, make you smarter. And, and when I say smarter, not in terms of cognition, but it's a way um, to empower people. So, so one way and you have children one way we as humans and not a psychologist but the one way we feel powerful is to be a member of a group is to is to associate with i mean for teenagers and middle schoolers it's a click 
for adults, it's it can be a sports team. Um, and these days, it's not just a political party. It's beyond Democrats and Republicans. It's, you know, do you believe that a pandemic that's killed nearly a million Americans is real or not? Are you okay with uh, wearing a mask in order to protect others? When when would you draw that line um, and say enough is enough? I mean, we're we are so polarized. The team mentality is is destroying not just us as a as a country, but it's having an impact on individual families and friendships and relationships. Um, so I would like people to see it's it's a it's a mechanism to get some bring some order to the chaos. And you know, I don't tell you how to do anything in the book. I just give you a framework to empower yourself to make make your own decisions and and have communication uh, around these difficult topics without paying a huge price. Um, and I just to say, I appreciate the feedback about about uh, the person that was wrote me off as um, as to sort of one way or the other. I, I get people mad at me from both sides of the political spectrum on Twitter. I get you know angry emails. Um, uh some some are quite uncomfortable i get letters um but i get them from both i would say more from the right because i am clearly uh i'm clearly a person that adheres to the rule of law and the republican party in this in this moment is is an authoritarian party and that really worries me um but but i get people mad at both on both sides of the spectrum and in that mind in my mind i say okay then maybe i'm doing something right <laughs> for sure yeah Kim, last time we had you on off off air, we had talked about um, our roles as parents. You know, Mike has two little girls, as do I. You've got some little ones as well. Um, when you think about just you know from the premise of this book, like what does a background? How does a background law support like help you as a parent? Yeah, well, one of the chapters is about you know actually the the, the ugly side of families um, family life, which is you know divorce, child custody issues. Um, how it helps me as a parent. So I just, I have a five part, I call it by cat. The, the first one is break down the issues. The second one is identify values, right? Um, that, that is, doesn't require a law degree. Um, we all have our value system. We don't necessarily articulate it affirmatively, uh, to ourselves, let alone to our children, but I, I do with my kids, you know, I'll say, you know, integrity is really important. Um, you know, for example, if you, you know, if you stick to, to the, doing the right thing, um, you, you know, you may, may not come out ahead, but you can always know that you have a lighthouse in the darkness, for example, but how does it help with parenting? When you, when you name, you write those things down very affirmatively and clearly, and then you're engaging your child around something and we all get triggered by our kids. They're exhausting. They're very smart and difficult. Uh, and it's a new frontier with every age. Um, if you if you're really clear about what matters to you as a parent, I think uh, you you can can get to decisions that maybe um, you wouldn't if you were just in a reactive mode. For example, uh, so you have a a teenager that wants to get a piercing. I think I talk about this in the book. And and you know, listen, we didn't do that as kids. No, right? That's a reaction. But if you kind of sit back and say, okay, what's important to me? What are my what are my values as a parent? And in law, by the way, you know, it's all value based. Why do we ban murder? Not because it it's the rule of the world, but because we value life. That's so we we ban it, right? Um, so you could say, listen, you know, I don't want them to have health care problems. I don't want an infection. Um, maybe there's a religious element to it, and that's important. I'm just making things up. Um, maybe it's allowing them to make some mistakes in a safe environment so that they can launch into independence. I mean, for me, launching them into independence is really important. You know, maybe it's allowing them some, some level of autonomy and I don't know, but if, if you name all of those things, right. And then you have it with your teenager, um, you have it out with your teenager. I think it's, um, at least in my experience, you can live with not, not having it exactly the way you want it as the parent and feel like it's the right thing. That's the last part of the, of my five part test. It's tolerating, tolerating the fact that you're not going to win everything. And, and that's part of life and that's part of law. So, so, you know, you could do it, for example, with vaccines, 
Do you send your kid to school or masking? Do you not send your kid to school? Well, what are your, you ident break it down into issues. There's a medical piece. There's the educational piece. There's a social piece for children. Um, and, and then step two, what are, what's your value system there? You know, and one of your value systems could be, listen, I just really don't like public schools dictating these important things. So you put that down. I mean, that might be one of your, your, but as, but if you name the rest and then you argue, kind of identify the pros and cons, which is what lawyers do, you might say, well, you know, my kid is kind of an ex extrovert. It's been really difficult. Zoom is awful. So, you know, even though I really, it really irks me that this, 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 this uh, school is mandating this, but my values now that I've written them down, you know, it's not Fox News, it's not CNN, they're mine for my family. This is kind of for me and my kids, this is this is where I'm going to, I'm going to fall on that sword and, and give this up because these other pieces are so important. So it's slowing it down, breaking it down and naming very specifically what's important to you and what facts then bear on it. So um, again, it's, it's a methodology. I call it with my students when I teach law, I call it a framework. It's a decision tree. It takes them weeks to understand it. it it disabusing students of the idea that that law like life is about outcomes and answers and shifting them to focus on questions is very 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 difficult um they they really don't like it they go kicking and screaming and that they're i mean some of them are willing to do it, but the point is their brains are so programmed for outcomes so programmed for x or y black or white blue or red, and then give some reason supporting your answer. Um, and I think that that leads to this polarized culture, frankly. I mean, it certainly doesn't help. And uh, Kim, speaking of thinking like a lawyer, uh, we want to ask you about some news making headlines. Um, <laughs> so we've got a couple questions here on, on that front. The first one for me comes on the heels of what's happening with former President Donald Trump. There's two cases one civil, one criminal, obviously the criminal one in Georgia, the civil one happening in New York. Where do you see some of this shaking out with former President Trump, specifically the civil suit? Now a judge recently ruled that he has to testify and some of the family members about the Trump uh, uh, the organization and, and some of their business practices. The criminal one is, in, I believe, still in the grand jury state or at least moving to the grand jury state. Where do you see some of this shaking out uh, in, in terms of former President Trump and, and the criminal and civil nature suits here? Well, I mean, and there's also actually a third or a second criminal investigation that's a parallel investigation in New York. It's not from the attorney general, which is the state law law enforcement official that's doing the civil side. It's the Manhattan DA. So that's happening. And then there's also, I think, you know, 17, 18, 19, all told. Um, investigations into Donald Trump um, that are still ongoing across, you know, having to do with, um, you know, how he ran the campaign to, you know, the the inaugural committee, things like that. I mean, it just goes on and on. I do think the situation in Florida, I mean, excuse me, in Georgia recently, the prosecutor in Georgia made clear she was not going to, she's going to follow the facts. She was not going to not bring an indictment if just because this is a former president. That's a situation for, you know, for listeners just who might not have it at their fingertips where it's on it's on an audio tape that he asked Brad Raffensperger to find enough votes to to swing a, an election that had already been audited in favor of Joe Biden to him. So so that's pretty good evidence. She's, I think, looking, you know, under every rock and in every nook and cranny. Um, but that's not a difficult case, even on what the we know publicly. I'm going to say it, I'm not saying it's a slam dunk, or even I'm not saying, saying there should be indictment. But this is not this is not threading a really fine needle. So there's that. In New York, um, you know, the Trump organization's already been indicted. So the question is, is it is Donald Trump and or his children going to be indicted? I read that decision um, just before the pot, actually, because I'm going to be on Don Lemon tonight about it, Mike. I read the decision out of New York where essentially Donald Trump and his two kids, um, Ivanka and Don Jr. Um, said, listen, we shouldn't have to be subpoenaed, period. And, you know, that judge was having none of it. And I can talk about legally um, w what he said. And I think he was spot on across the board. This is another circumstance of throwing the spaghetti against the wall 
and seeing if anything stuck. Nothing stuck, but the judge really got upset because he got he got to the point where some of the arguments were were I don't know what the word he was, but beyond frivolous and and maybe even misconduct. I, I you know, after given that Mazars, their accounting firm, has has re- retracted ten years of financial statements suggesting that they were based on bad information and that bad information came presumably from the Trump family and or you know people within the Trump organization. I mean, Mazars has been on been worked for the Trump family since Donald Trump's dad for decades. Um, you know, the walls are closing in on on Donald Trump and he no longer can hide behind the protections and privileges of the presidency. Um so so which will drop first? I don't know. It's impossible to read the tea leaves, but I think you know the world is, or America is closer to accountability for Donald Trump um, than ever before. And let me add one more thing. That's obviously the mount, the the elephant in the room, the January sixth committee, right? They're going to be holding public hearings, reportedly in April. Jamie Raskin, um, House of Representatives, from member from from uh, Maryland, who was a chief impeachment manager in the second impeachment. He's also on the January 6th committee. He said that it's going to bring the house down. That is, this is new information we're gonna hear as Americans. I have a suspicion, just a gut feeling, uh, that part of the reason that the Justice Department is holding back is because the January 6th committee is poised to educate the American people, right? Get people used to the notion that this is, there's a line that's been drawn here because there's a gut sense that, oh, you could never go after a former president. Um, so we just have to see, you know, uh, Teflon Don, I mean, any Teflon pan eventually it's, you know, wears out if you, if you beat it up too much and uh, this might just be a straw too far. It's a great analogy. <laughs> it sounds like you're all telling me that that Trump crypto I bought probably not a good idea. <laughs> or the app. Yeah. Did you that's, or that app? degree from Trump university. You know what, Nick, yeah. Yeah, it's it's in the back. I mean, <laughs> not like, the way to go. You know, I mean, and are you uh, a class action member on that one? Too? I, <laughs> you're not going to see I'm, a penny. I, I, I replied to the text. So you, right. You're not going to see a penny. Sorry. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Get to your question. Um, Come on. <laughs> you, you, Kim, you mentioned earlier about vaccines. You yeah. know, think of other headlines. You know, um, where are you thinking with the Supreme Court currently um, most recently? You know, supporting the or standing behind the decision with the uh, University of Indiana. Um, what's your te- what's your sense as far as where the court may lean? I guess where I, what comes up for me is: Are we in any pos- position where even you know, currently in any state, you know, almost all vaccines prior to COVID are usually asked up for children, especially in K eight settings, K twelve. Um, are we in a situation where the court may potentially make this into a state's matter? Uh, well, I mean, they did say that, you know, Joe Biden's vaccine mandate in the workplace was unlawful. Uh, I think that was a stretch from a legal standpoint. Um, I, I, you know, that this gets to a bigger question, which is, and I've actually, I just filed a piece with the Atlantic today, um, on this big bigger question. I mean, we talk about single party rule. Uh, in the state and federal legislatures as a problem, right? I mean, people that are, have their finger on this know that democracy is failing in the legislature due in part to the big lie. Um, but we already have it on the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm This court, these, these the five justices that are now controlling the court with now Ch- Chief Justice Roberts joining the progressives, joined the progressives on a on gerrymandering case this week um, and he's no fan of voting rights. This court is going to, you know, unilaterally rewrite the laws of this nation, and at least that's my concern. And and the writing is completely on the wall. And when I say that, strike down acts of Congress, amend acts of Congress. They've already done that. Um, ignore procedural rules that require, I mean, not require that respect lower court judgments. Uh, wait to hear full briefing and argument on important issues. Um, uh, protect the Constitution itself, right? SB eight in Texas, you know, you might you might be against abortion. That's fine, but it, you know, the Constitution has been construed so far. 
to protect it at 24 weeks. I mean, that's just the way it is. It, you know, the way we do things is you change the law. I mean, but the law is still the law. The court said we're okay with certain unconstitutional laws being in place. Um, we're going to see this court change interpretations of the Constitution um, you know, in ways that have massive effects on American life. And uh, they're doing it under the guise of somehow being conservative jurists that just color between the lines. It's really a problem because there's no accountability for Supreme Court justices. They can't be fired at the polls and they're ignoring Congress. So Congress can't, can't legislate over them. I mean, this is a disaster. Now, as far as vaccines, uh, I do think they will respect, likely respect states right, state rights in that in that regard, unless it conflicts with religion. And by religion, I mean primarily probably Christianity. Um, you know, honestly, there's no intellectually consistent principle, either legally, ethically, um, that I can discern from from the the you know the trajectory of these opinions, other than ideology, political ideology. And that's catastrophic for America. And I say this having, you know, I, I know, you know, I've, I, I have affinity personally. Um, you know, it's not like for, for, for some of the, those on the court personally, um, but I think it's an abdication of their constitutional responsibilities and frankly unethical, the what's going on there. It's just really awful. Yeah. With, you know, in matters of abortion, we think recently about the situation in Texas. You know, basically, you know, now citizens are encouraged to dime out doctors, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, also, what we're seeing play out in Mississippi, Florida recently is starting to uh, institute a law as well. You know, with what you were saying earlier about where the court is starting to lean with those five justices, are we heading to a place where effectively Roe versus Wade is probably not going to make it out of 2022? Uh, there's no question. It already has been killed in the state of Texas without actually killing it. That's what's just amazing to me, what this court did. This court allowed an unconstitutional law to go into effect and to stay into effect, even though it means forced pregnancies and deliveries for women. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that train has left the station. Now, there's some speculation that Chief Justice Roberts will get a deal to move the viability line from 24 weeks back to 15 weeks or something like that um but but it's it's pretty evident that these justices the new justices um kavanaugh i mean coney barrett um certainly alito is alito's gotten even more radical uh, and i don't i don't use that word lightly very radical justice gorsuch radical um thomas radical about this stuff um uh, they don't have any problem reversing Roe versus Wade. They the last three were put on the court to reverse Roe versus Wade, uh, and it's just to me, as a law professor, as a lawyer, um, as someone who wrote this book about reason, thoughtful, coherent decision making, they are violating the most basic, fundamental, first year, first week of law school type of things to twist the outcome in ways that are politically favorable to their party. Again, the way we have the law, the law is the law. If you don't like it, you got to get it changed, but you're stuck complying with it. The law says 24 weeks for women. Texas is six weeks. The standard for getting emergency relief, you have to show that it's there's a law that it's violating. Boom, Roe versus Wade. You have to show that it hurts Somebody's going to be hurt if you don't stop it. Pregnancy does actually take a toll on people, both economically, physically, psychologically, on so many levels. Three, they're in the public interest, it's better to just wait for the Mississippi case, right? And we had the bounty hunter law in Texas, right, which you mentioned. So that's whether, regardless of what your position is on abortion, that's just terrible policy that you need to stop until you figure out if it's okay. The court ignored that three part standard right? And, and just allowed the law to stay, take it. I mean, this is it just, and I teach my students, the constitution is the boss of the bosses. That's the biggest law of the land. Well, not for this court, if it comes to a, a constitutional right, they don't care about. Then you take what happened with the gerrymandering case, right? So 
Alabama, after the 2020 census, reconfigured its electoral districts. There are seven of them. So gerrymandering is where politicians get to carve up districts and they get to do it in these tortured ways to make sure they're concentrated in one party or another. They have seven districts, 27% of Alabamans are African-American. And of the seven, there's only one predominantly black district. The other five or the other six are white. So there was a lawsuit filed under the Voting Rights Act. A three judge panel conducted a thorough evidentiary and legal and um, investigation of this two Trump appointees on the panel struck, said, listen, this is unconstitutional. This is not unconstitutional. Excuse me. This violates the voting rights act. You need to go back and, and, and do two black districts and five white districts be, given the population of, of, um, of Alabama and the problems and the voting rights act and an emergency motion, emergency motion. Okay. The Supreme Court reversed that lower court in a one paragraph decision, no full briefing, no argument, put the gerrymandered law back in place. Acknowledging it might violate the rights of African American people in Alabama. Here again, just like SB8. Okay, we might have, we have an unconstitutional, and when it comes to the gerrymandering thing, we might have a blatantly illegal law possibly it might be but we're going to keep it going i mean that this is not um debating whether there should be substantive due process and we should have abortion that was the old this is this is saying this is a a big pardon my french a big f u to the rule of law a big f u to congress a big f u to voters a big f u to the lower the lower federal courts a big f u to precedent a big F you uh, to, to just ethics and, and inclusion and respect for humanity. I'm so, I, this is the sleeping giant folks. I mean, single party authoritarian rule is here and it's in the form of five people in robes on the United States Supreme Court. And for people who are conservative and think, well, that's fine because they're on my team. That's why I wrote this book. Guess what? When you peel back the, the onions and you start breaking the issues down, you're going to get hit hit too. You're going to get it's going to affect you and your family as well. Because you're taking your voice off the table. So when it comes to when they come for you, it's too late. You know, I, this is I I don't know what can be done about it. I mean, what could be done about it? Unpacking the Supreme Court, but we have our filibuster and we have two mem- members of the United States Senate and the Democratic Party that aren't willing to do anything. Kim, I remember you saying that last time about, you know, this is pressing, this is pressing. Um, It's what I appreciate about you to the people in Buffalo, New York, who wrote you that letter. Okay. You can email us at canwepleasetalkpodcast at gmail.com if you want references and realize why Kim (laughs) Whaley should have spoken that day, because I'll happily respond back to you. I love diving in the muck, Kim, when people email us or tweet to us. But you can check out Kim's book. It comes out this Tuesday, How to Think Like a Lawyer and Why, A Common Sense Guide to Everyday Dilemmas. You can check her out across the news landscape. Check out her books. I'm telling you, they're they're educational and informative. I don't know what those people are talking about in Buffalo. Kim, uh, uh, you've got two pre-orders coming this way. Uh, We're excited to read the book. And thank you for coming on the pod. You are always welcome here. And thank you for continuing to bang the drum, you know, because for Nick and I, who are in different spaces, education and and in sports, you know, a, a legal mind like yours uh, is invaluable and your students are really lucky to have you. Well, thank you so much. I always enjoy chatting with you. The time flies by and appreciate uh, you um, sharing the book with your listeners. I, I think it should come in handy for a few people. So thank you for having me.